Hello, AP Hug. We're going to do some snow day notes for you here. So we're going to pick up out of uh, out of Unit 4, right where we left off in class. And just to remind you, the regular drill when it comes to video notes, um, just it's just like your room 229. I'm walking you through some notes. You're writing them down in your notebook. I'm trying to give you some extra information that you can use for your left column, that kind of business, okay? And so, uh, yeah, just... Uh, this way we're going to go through about 30 minutes worth, see if we can uh, crank out um, a bunch of slides, and um, and then we'll go from there. All right. So um, where we left off was kind of uh, taking, actually it was almost like, it was like a little world history lesson, um, but taking a look at um, how political processes had changed and helped to uh, create um, conflicts, things like that is where we pretty much wound things up. So where we're going to go here um, this morning is going to be into section three. And so uh, here we go. We have some political power or different concepts uh, that, that connect in with kind of political processes stretched across the globe. And then we're also going to define and give you some examples of this idea of territoriality. Yeah, it's easy for me to say. All right. Um, let's see. So in this section, when we talk about this distribution of, of political power, so political power, how it's spread around the world, how it's used in different ways, uh, how it's had influences over history, all of that kind of business. Okay. And when we uh, talk about that distribution of power, geopolitics definitely comes into play. And this is where we get in kind of, you know, the heart of, of AP human geography and, and this unit. And so uh, what you've got there. You know, the, the, again, effects of geography, boom, that's uh, what we're talking about and how it has uh, play into political processes and uh, relationships between different states um, most of the time, which uh, result in just nothing but, uh, you know, just another normal day in the neighborhood, but uh, sometimes result in uh, conflict, wars, that kind of business, okay? All of it kind of falls under this, uh, this, this kind of bigger umbrella term, geopolitics. And, uh, and so uh, territoriality, uh, first one we'll jump into there. Um, easily defined and pretty kind of connected to, I think, the definition I gave you on your, uh, your, your second vocab sheet is what you have right there. Um, when you have a, uh, a nationality, a population, who has created over time such an identity with, with a piece of land, a piece of territory, um, that they have grown to have, you know, basically connections, traditions um, to that land. And, and they feel that they're being threatened by someone from, uh, from another territory, you know, it can be another state, it can be that, that sort of thing. It's that, like it says, I mean, I, there's, there's not really any other way I can, I can explain it to you there other than that idea of that willingness to defend land. Um, if you're, you know, when you reach that point where it's pretty much just, you know, this is ours. And, uh, if, if you uh, try to make a move against any of it, uh, we will fight you, you know, to, uh, to defend our land, uh, that sort of thing. That's that, that, that is the concept of territoriality. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's one thing if you claim a bunch of land, but someone comes along and says, no, we think it's ours. And you're coming, oh, okay, go ahead, have it. It's a, we, you know, it was fun while we had it, but no, it's when you are willing to stand and fight for it. Okay. Uh, territoriality has some of those connections to culture and, uh, you know, the, the conflict that we've already talked about in this class can be looked through a, a geopolitical lens. Because when we look in the Middle East, uh, we see uh, two big powers. Saudi Arabia is uh, a, a, one of a big, physically speaking, big state, uh, but also has uh, a lot of, of wealth and power and influence in the Middle East. Uh, it is, is uh, led and largely populated by Sunni uh, Muslims. And then when we look at uh, ir ir over the country, a little further to the east, Iran, um, they are a largely Shia um, population and leadership. Uh, and then there's also kind of a cultural split beyond that. The Saudi Arabians view themselves as Arabs. Uh, Iranians view themselves as Persians. And that's a that's more of a, a cultural, uh, you know, ethnic kind of a, a definition. And so, you know, you have those kind of conflicts that split spin out from there. 
And, uh, you know, we were I just, just that was last time I saw you guys it was reminding you about what was going on in Yemen and Houthi rev, uh, rebels and all of that. And, and that is in part because there's a little bit of that proxy situation going there where Iran is supporting those rebels in Yemen. And, uh, and so you, yeah, as a result, you have conflict, you have armed, you know, conflict going on warfare uh, that's happening. So that's what we talk about where territoriality can play out into reality okay um whether you're talking about arabs whether you're talking about uh, iranians whether you're talking about the, the yemen people all of them are you know willing to defend their land and 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 in some cases fighting uh to defend their land and defend their even uh, going a little beyond territoriality defend their influence and then um some examples, and we we may be have time to uh, look at this a little more closely in class, and uh, where we see this uh, especially uh, connecting in with the economic aspects. Uh, it's not all about just you know borders and and political power and that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of times, at, at at the root base of a lot of conflict is going to be uh, economic power and uh, the ability to uh, to make money. Um, uh, some of the disputes that arise out of that, especially when it comes over um, territory that has resources. And when I say territory, I could be talking about land that has, you know, oil under the surface. Uh, it could be off the coast uh, where you've got, uh, you know, maybe uh, waters that are, uh, you know, highly populated with uh, valuable fish that can be, you know, fished and harvested, all that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, some people, you look through the long stretch of history and you are going to find example after example after example where countries go to war with each other, just not over the sheer, you know, idea of power, okay, you know, that I want to conquer, create an empire, um, but how oftentimes it has to do with, uh, with economics. Um, you could uh, make the argument that World War II and the Pacific in large part uh, started because Japan did not have access to the oil it needed to uh, continue to grow the way it wanted to grow. And when the United States um, tried to punish Japan uh, in in the early 1940s for some of its aggressive actions it was taking in Asia, uh, we uh, we placed an oil embargo on Japan. The United States refused to sell any oil to Japan, and uh, that played a role in why Japan um, why why Japan ended up going to war with us. Why they. Uh, attacked us in Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 was pretty much, you know, here's your, your, here's our answer to your embargo, your refusal to sell us oil that we need to survive. That kind of thing. That's where territoriality can get into uh, the economic part of it. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to go really quickly through, uh, through this next section here. Uh, again, these are defined on your list, but, uh, when we look at this uh, political power and the way that it is kind of spread around, these are two, you know, excuse me, three uh, theories that I'm going to uh, roll at you really quickly that attempt to explain certain ideas about uh, I don't know, kind of the, the balance of world power through history. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that these are these are still theories that have a lot of influence in the 21st century. Uh, may speak more to the 19th and 20th century. Okay, uh, the first of them is the uh, the work of. Uh, oh, hold on, just a sec here. Oh, geez, I was disrupted by dogs. Um, anyhow, so um, these three theories kind of explain. Y'all get world power. All right. Um, the first one here was uh, introduced uh, a long time ago by uh, a German Friedrich Ratzel, and it's called the organic theory. And pretty much just kind of the way it explains there, you know, that um, a state, a country is just pretty much like any other living thing and needs what it needs to survive. And what uh, states need to survive, space, right? Uh, no, and, you know, people, you could argue that as well. But uh, this kind of both gets you both, the, rot the organic theory. Um, and it is just this idea that, uh, that you know, it, it's almost like law of the nature, you know, rule of the jungle kind of a thing where, you know, powerful countries, states are going to devour weaker states and the, the powerful ones will do this to, you know, to survive. All right. Uh, leave it, what you know, I have there in the, in the parentheses, kind of a, an example you could uh, use to explain this. Uh, one of the things prior to world war two that, uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany was, uh, 
making very clear kind of a center part of his 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 political kind of theories and his plans for Germany was that the German people, because they were a superior people, um, ethnically, culturally, everything else you can know with that, that they deserved more land than other people. And uh, he called that land, he referred to it as, uh, you know, living space. And uh, Lebensraum is German for living space. And so when he is planning World War II in the late 30s and then carries it out, begins it in 1939, it is to provide more space for the German people, more living space. That's organic theory in action. And it's going to be his you know, almost obsession with uh, obtaining more Lebensraum for the German people that triggers World War II in Europe. All right. So that is one theory. Uh, another one that we have here comes to us from a, uh, a British, um, this guy was, uh, this guy was, uh, was a geographer, but uh, Sir uh, Helford Mackinder. And uh, he developed what uh, came to be known as the Heartland Theory. And if you look at that map over there on the right side, and you see where it identifies Heartland, it's in an area that we refer to as Eurasia. Okay, a uh, little bit of a uh, little bit of of Europe in there, a little bit of uh, Asia in there, uh, kind of stretches across, uh, you know, from Eastern Europe through through well, what you got in the parentheses down there, okay, from Russia and then into uh, the central parts of Asia, and it pretty much was uh, this theory that uh, that whoever dominated the heartland pretty much dominated that part of the world. I mean, it wasn't like you know. As simply as if you own the heartland, you rule the world. Um, but you definitely, back in a time when people were much more centered on, uh, you know, pretty much just everything around uh, Europe and beyond, uh, th this was viewed as as the key to to dominance uh, in in this part of the world. And you know, I don't know if Hitler read the heartland theory or understood it, but. Uh, in 1941, when he sends his troops invading into the Soviet Union, um, in effect, you know, I mean, that's what he is doing. He's he's moving into Eurasia uh, with the uh, the idea that if he he can defeat them and dominate them, that's going to put him one step closer to you know pretty much ruling all of of Europe and and stretching you know further and further into into Asia itself. All right. Of course, Hitler lost, and you know none of that came true. So there you go. All right, and then uh, one more theory, and that is this one right here. Uh, Nicholas Spikeman, I believe he was Dutch, who uh, developed the Rimland theory, and this is kind of the uh, the flip side of uh, of the Heartland theory, uh, where the Heartland theory, you know, if we, here let me let me roll back here. Can I do that here? We're just gonna mess things up. There we go. Uh, where the Heartland theory back over here, you know, is is very, very just kind of land based. Rimland theory. Notice pretty much everything that is in that area, the yellow of the Rimland theory. Most all of it, I won't say every last bit, but the majority of it has water access. Okay, and uh, and so Spikeman's theory was that uh, you know, hey, it's good and all if you're going to want to dominate the land like that, but really. If you're really talking about true dominance and global domination it's it's being able to control the seas and the oceans okay so that's kind of where he's going is that the uh, you know the keys to the kingdom the keys to you know to doing all of that is control of the seas or what he calls maritime based global domination maritime is a word you might as well get used to uh, it's one of those college board words when they when you see that it just has anything to do with oceans and seas Okay, uh, the waters, uh, but a lot of times they use that term maritime. Pops up again in AP world. Yeah, I don't know, one of those things. All right, okay, now we're going to move into section four, and we are going to go through a catalog of how we divide up states and countries and everything else under the sun uh, on our on our beautiful planet here, and uh, take a look at um, a dizzying collection of different points of boundaries, okay? And yes, you have to know these. Uh, the, you will you will no doubt be uh, tested on this in some way on the AP test itself, uh, but just even the Survive Unit 4 here in my class, you're going to have to get pretty good with these, okay? So uh, most of these are uh, on your vocab sheet, so I'll make it quick. 
uh, try to give you an example, you know, kind of move on like that way, all right? So uh, the basic definition for a boundary is just kind of what you see on the, uh, on the picture on the right side, okay? Uh, some kind of a line, uh, sometimes just drawn on a map, sometimes a physical line. We'll talk about that as we move on. But uh, yeah, shows where uh, everything that you claim to be yours uh, comes to an end and then where all the land claimed by them begins, right? And, uh, or another definition given to you there, um, actually on the slide, right? There are all kinds of types of boundaries. So we'll look at those and then we'll go, we'll break it down even further. We'll look at classifications of boundaries. The most basic kind of boundary is a defined boundary, all right? And this is one where there's there's little to no disagreement about it. Uh, there's usually uh, been some kind of a treaty between two or more states in establishing the boundary. Everyone's good with it. No one says, well, wait a minute. No, there's no, there's no real dispute. Um, it's it's going to have some kind of legal... Uh, binding to it okay and uh, so that that's pretty much your idea and like I said most boundaries around the world you look at are defined boundaries and it's a it's a good place to start in terms of the most uh, the most common type okay a delimited boundary uh, these are these are boundaries that if you look at a map you see lines drawn but they're not really lines that people pay a whole lot of attention to um, you know county lines uh, for you know like the state of Washington those are those are delimited boundaries um, it's not like you're always thinking about, you know, hey, I just Clark, you know, crossed from Clark County into this, you know, you, you, it, they're, they're there, they're, everyone knows that those boundaries exist, but they don't really mean anything on the day to day. Okay. You know, even cities establish their own boundaries. Um, and, and so, you know, you'll have your, your city limits, you know, you're welcome, you know, entering Vancouver, you know, but that's not a boundary you really sit and think much about. Okay. Um, you know, Washington State is divided into voting districts, and those voting districts have boundaries that if you look at a map, you can see them drawn on there. But again, another one on the day-to-day, -day, yeah, all that, right? Those are all examples of delimited boundaries. It's just maps, uh, lines on the map, but but beyond, you know, what they define, uh, they don't have a significant impact on the day-to-day. Right, demarcated boundaries. These are ones where you know that you are crossing the boundary, either because there is some kind of a uh, a, a physical object, such as a a wall, a fence, a gate, something like that, or it may just be marked in a way. I mean, you know, every morning when I uh, when I come over the bridge. Uh, into uh into washington i always am greeted by the welcome to washington and it's like yeah it seems like i was just here and then i get the reverse when i'm coming home and go over the bridge and you know welcome to oregon you know those welcome signs are examples of, of demarcation okay um you know if uh if we did have some kind of an actual fencing between us and and you know between Washington and Oregon, again, that would be demarcation. Um, you know, I mean, you look through history, there's examples of demarcated lines. You think the Great Wall of China uh, that they built to try to uh, hold off um, invaders from the north. Uh, my picture over there on the left side shows uh, the Berlin Wall, which during the Cold War, when uh, the Soviet Union built a wall through the city of Berlin to divide the, the part of Berlin that they controlled, uh, versus the other side that uh, was controlled by the British, the United States, uh, the French, kind of what was considered to be free Berlin, okay? Um, you know, there's even sections of our border uh, down between the United States and Mexico uh, that have uh, demarcated um, sections, you know, in, in, as far as built walls that, that divide. Any of that, okay? All demarcated boundaries, and then uh, the last one, pretty easy one to figure out there, natural boundaries. And this is when it, uh, we have that geographic feature. I mean, you know, kind of no-brainer. The Columbia River that divides, you know, Washington and Oregon. Um, you know, it, it, whenever you see that, we have uh, some of our states that, uh, especially Rocky Mountain states, where uh, we use some of that geography of the Rocky Mountains to, uh, to divide it. Um, any, any, any state, okay, you know, whether we're talking about small S states here in the U.S., uh, or or big S state, you know, United States. My other picture shows, um, you know, that that uh, example of the Rio Grande that uh, divides a, a part of uh, the United States and Mexico. Okay, all those would be examples of natural boundaries. All right.
Let's see, geometric boundaries. Yes, straight lines. Um, and pretty much the way it sounds. I, I, another one I don't really need to beat to death. I mean, when you look at our, a yeah, good chunk of what our eastern uh, boundary with, uh, with Idaho uh, is uh, largely geometric, okay? Uh, that, that kind of thing. So, yep, whenever, whenever you just have straight lines, we uh, have uh, some of that here in Oregon as well. Southern border, eastern border, just uh, straight lines, straight lines. And then uh, cultural is, uh, like it says there, human traits, behavior, cultural traits, uh, that sort of thing. And I give you the example there of, um, I'm trying to remember, hold on here. Uh, example is showing kind of that, that Balkans region we were talking about last week, Kosovo, uh, kind of uh, parts of Yugoslavia when uh, the Soviet Union broke up and uh, some conflict that took place in there. The, a lot of the boundaries, a lot of the boundaries in there were very, very, when we talk about, you know, you can zero in on that teeny, tiny little, but uh, very fluid. These are really uh, cultural boundaries are probably among the more difficult to, uh, to understand because uh, a lot of times, again, they're not necessarily going to be drawn on a map um, and, and they can change as, as cultural groups kind of, uh, you know, possibly move around, uh, migrate from place to place. And so that one is, it gets, it gets a little bit more into, uh, some of that, some of that gray area. Um, all right. All right. So, uh, from, uh, from cultural boundaries, now we're going to, uh, move it in back kind of out and, uh, take a, a little bit of a bigger look at, uh, this classification of boundaries. So how do we classify? Again, it's just more of kind of keeping all these different definitions straight for ourselves. Um, and so on this one, we can take a look at, uh, well, like I said, it basically boils down to just another list, okay? Uh, antecedent uh, boundaries. And so these are boundaries usually historically. I give you the example there of Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, boundaries a lot of times that are, are drawn a long time ago um, and before you had, like it says there, uh, a lot of people who are present in the area. Um, but even with the in influx of people, the boundary still stays the same. Um, even our boundary with Canada, which was established along the 49th parallel way back early, um, you know, early 19th century. Um, and at a time when really the majority of the population was, you know, north of that parallel, First Nation people and south of the parallel, um, you know, indigenous uh, American Indian people. Um, there weren't a lot of, of settlers coming from the, uh, the eastern parts of either of those two countries, those two states that had moved westward by that point, that early on. Um, and so we can refer to those as examples of antecedent boundaries. Uh, you look at, you know, in the here and now, and yes, large populations, all that, but, uh, uh, but not when the boundaries were originally drawn. Okay. Um, subsequent boundaries. So drawn to, uh, yeah, yeah. So where you have religious differences, uh, linguistic differences. Um, again, I, I can look to, uh, the, the, the Balkans, uh, in South, Southeast, uh, Europe to give us some examples of that, uh, especially where we get some of the religious, really, they kind of fit all three, the religious, ethnic, and linguistic, um, if you look at uh, Ireland, you know, you have Northern Ireland and then the rest of Ireland. Northern Ireland is a largely Protestant uh, part of Ireland and the rest of it is Catholic. And so uh, though they, their boundaries and they are viewed as, as separate states um, and their boundaries are drawn to, you know, get to accommodate those religious differences that you have there. So whenever you have those kind of examples going on, I think with most subsequent boundaries, don't quote me on this, but I think most of them tend to be more of the religious uh, difference. But you can sometimes see some of those ethnic, like in the uh, the Balkans uh, or linguistic differences, so uh, just uh, differences in language. Okay, a relic boundary. Uh, yeah, this is uh, where you have um, evidence of a boundary that used to be there, okay? Um, some people even claim that uh, the Great Wall of China could be almost viewed now as a relic boundary. It's like a tourist you know, site to go visit. Um, when we look at uh, the map uh, that you're viewing over there um, on the right side, that is what Berlin looked like from uh, about 1945 to 1989. And uh, and that was back goes back to the time when um, 
Berlin, like Germany, was divided between the Soviet Union and then um, the countries that all kind of viewed themselves as the West. Uh, and and they were well established boundaries back then. Like I, like I told you, at one point, um, the the Soviet Union went in there and and built a wall between their section that you see in red and then the uh, the sections that were being uh, basically controlled by the French, British, and Americans, and and drew their uh, you know their demarcated boundary, splitting Berlin in two. Uh, that wall came down in 1989. There's still pieces of the wall that are there, as like tourist attractions or you know museum piece, that kind of a thing. Um, so there's still some evidence of, uh, of that boundary that still exists. Uh, but for the most part, you know, again, it has no political, uh, importance anymore. It's, it's a, a former boundary, um, relic. All right. And then a superimposed boundary drawn by outside powers. Think about what we were talking about last week about imperialism in Africa, okay? And the Berlin Conference in 1885. When those European leaders get together and roll that map out and they start taking their chunks of Africa for themselves uh, to, uh, to create their, you know, their empires uh, in, in Africa, they were drawing superimposed boundaries. Um, they're taking into account nothing at all about conditions on the ground. They're not looking at the diff ethnic you know, differences between various uh, parts of the po African population. They are drawing lines that serve them, serve their wants, serve their needs. And so uh, that's what we see uh, with superimposed boundaries. All right. Militarized boundaries. Um, yes, have we? Oh, there we go. The, the, it's pretty much again another one that, that pretty much kind of uh, kind of speaks for itself. Um, probably main example I could give you on that one is um, North and South Korea, uh, what they call the DMZ, the de demilitarized zone uh, that separates those two. And uh, you know, it, and and it sounds kind of I don't know. It's one of those demilitarized. Sounds like there should be nothing there, but really, it's considered one of the most dangerous places on the earth. Uh, there's there's so much uh, firepower that is is aimed at this little strip of land that divide the the two countries, um, and it, it is because uh, the two countries view each other as, as basically as as enemies, and uh, and because they fought a war back in the 1950s that was never officially ended, the Korean War ended ended with an armistice, not with a peace treaty, and so technically the Korean War is still on. Uh, and so they have to always be ready for the possibility that war could break out. And so uh, they would be a prime example of a militarized boundary. All right. And then open boundaries uh, where there's uh, where there's there's no there, there's nothing that keeps you from moving you know, from place to place. I mean, you think, you know, within our country, you know, states, small states, you know, we have open open boundaries. You think of Europe, uh, the countries that belong to the European Union. Uh, they have an understanding that their boundaries are all open as well, all right? And then you could just look at the whole, you know, our ongoing political debate that we have in our country uh, over immigration and our southern border with Mexico. Um, and and that term open boundaries oftentimes being being used in the political debate, all right? So that is that, and and by definition, hopefully lays it all out there for you. All right, um, let's see what we can do here and uh, maybe wrap this up by looking at some uh, some boundary disputes and then we'll call it we'll call it good. OK, uh, so your first example there um, definitional. This is when you have countries and my example I'll give you there is Chile and Argentina um, who kind of argue about uh, sometimes because it's really, really unpopulated territory down there around their boundary area because it gets into some really rugged geography um they've they've had some disputes over the time they've never they've never spilled over into warfare or anything like that um but it it's because it is difficult to just literally to interpret the geography in there uh it is so rugged it is so um just i mean it, it a lot of it it's difficult for humans to even get into um, because just it is such a, a forbidding landscape. And so that, that has created some issues where, you know, they both understand there's a boundary between them, but it's just trying to get some of the, the fine points of it, you know, where it actually lies 
in some stretches of, of their boundary. That would be a definitional, okay? Locational, um, yeah, where a boundary should be. This is where you have two countries that are, you know, one saying, well, the boundary's here, you know, and the other country's saying, you know, no, you're 20 miles into my land, the boundary's over there. Um, and uh, i give you the example, I'll go quickly on this, but um, the, the term irredentism uh, is, is one when you have uh, people who have an ethnic connection to, who live in one state, who have a, an ethnic connection to another state. And when, uh, when Germany declared war on Poland and started World War II in September 1939, part of Hitler's claims on Poland is that in a, uh, in a far western part of Poland uh, called Danzig, um, there was a high population of people who lived there that ethnically shared more with Germany than they did with Poland. And, Ger and Hitler was pretty much saying, you know, I, these people should be part of Germany, um, was his logic. And, and one of the reasons why he gave uh, for declaring war on Poland. Um, he, had, he had acted on, on irredentism before, before World War II broke out. Also with Czechoslovakia, claimed a chunk of their land uh, and said that, you know, the vast majority of the population who live on this land ethnically are more German than Czech. And, uh, and so those get into examples of locational disputes. He was saying the boundary should be here, and because of who these people are and their ethnic identity, yeah, that kind of a thing, okay? Um, you could also uh, talk about our war with Mexico back in the uh, late 1840s. Uh, the uh, American-Mexican War was fought over um, our claim that uh, the Rio Grande was the uh, the southern border between the United States and Mexico, and Mexico's claim that it was actually the Nueces River that is a little further north uh, of the Rio Grande. And they said that, no, that river is the boundary, and we couldn't get it figured out, and it ended up in a war. All right? Let's see. Um, when we talk about um, operational, uh, how a border functions, this means as far as, okay, if someone's coming across the border, what kind of identity do they need to be able to show? If they're coming across the border to uh, to claim asylum, how does that procedure work legally, okay? You know, are they taken into uh, into custody and held? Uh, are they, uh, this gets into the nitty gritty, the, you know, the, the really, just kind of really getting deep in the weeds here as far as, um, how it works when a person wants to enter another country and that country wants control over who they're letting in. All right. And, uh, and so what the, you know, what the measures are, the operational measures that they take to try to control their borders and the people who are coming and the people who are going, uh, through their borders. All right. So, um, and in the past in history, and, and we've even had some disputes with the Mexican government here, you know, in the last, uh, I'm sure, 20, 30 years at least, uh, where we we disagree on on how crossing from Mexico into the United States and from the United States down to Mexico, how it should work. Okay, you know, right there on the ground when you're at the border crossing and the border agents are talking to you, um, you know, how that all works out. Those are all examples of operational boundary disputes. <coughs> oh, almost made it without a cough. All right. And then the, uh, the last one that we'll cover here, allocational boundary disputes. And, uh, and this gets into, yes, uh, when, when you have uh, resources that another country wants. Um, back in the early 90s, uh, the country of Iraq in the Middle East invaded the teeny tiny little oil rich country of Kuwait. And um, Iraq attacked, claiming that Kuwait was um, basically using underground um, oil drilling to uh, to drill oil that rightfully belonged to Iraq, and it, and it got into a, all this um, dispute over oil. Okay, I mean a natural resource, uh, and and how oil that was deposited under the soil along the boundary between Iraq and Kuwait. Who did that oil belong to? And uh, Iraq made the bold move to pretty much say, it's all ours, and uh, invaded Kuwait. And then that resulted in a war where a whole bunch of countries, including the United States, uh, went over and pushed Iraq back out of Kuwait um, 
to pretty much say, you know, respect the boundary, that kind of a thing. But that all started out of an allocational, uh, what can be known as the Persian Gulf War, started out as an allocational boundary dispute. All right. Okay, that's about 35 minutes of uh, good stuff here, and I'm going to call it good uh, at that point. And uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, if we're out again, um, I may be doing some more video for you. All right. Um, well, we'll see what happens. Other than that, stay, stay warm, stay safe, and uh, hope to see you soon. Miss you. Bye.